The title of today's message is Bomb Proof Your Relationship with God. And I almost didn't want to call it that. I was like, no, oh, you know, that's going to, that might look weird on the internet, you know? People are like, Bomb Proof, what is that? But anyway, that's the title of today's message. So if you would, turn to 2 Kings chapter 24. If you are having trouble getting into reading the Bible and it's like, hey, I, I get some of these things and it's just kind of like really boring, Todd, I don't know. If you would read like 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, there's a lot of good stuff there. You'll learn a lot, but also there's some history there and it goes pretty quickly. And it's just important stuff to, uh, to kind of know about the kings and King Saul and King David and Solomon and all the other kings uh, leading up into the exile. And um, so that's kind of what you have here in 2 Kings. We have the very, very end of the nation of Israel before they go into exile um, under Nebuchadnezzar. And it's, uh, it's pretty pretty wild and the thing is is that it's wild but also it's kind of short and compact and it's like if if you you really want the full picture you got to read the prophets right you would read Jeremiah and you would get a lot of the specific details because here we're going to read a a few verses and get uh, a gist of it but um, important stuff but like I said if you want to get like real specific you want to read some of the prophets and Jeremiah and and um, Isaiah, and it gives you some real specific things of what's going on, talking about some of the kings. But we're going we're to start reading in verse 8. And we're going to read a good portion of Scripture today, so just hang with me. Verse 8, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was N- Nushta, daughter of Elnathan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight as his fathers had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched up to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. Then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to the city while his servants were besieging it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, along with his mother, his servants, his commanders, and his officials, surrendered to the king of Babylon. So the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign. He also carried off from there all the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king's palace, and he cut into pieces all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the Lord's sanctuary, just as God had predicted. Then he deported all Jerusalem and all the commanders and all the fighting men, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and metalsmiths, except for the poorest people of the land, nobody remained. Nebuchadnezzar deported Jehoiachin to Babylon. Also, he took the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the leading men of the land into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The king of Babylon also brought captive into Babylon all 7,000 fighting men and 1,000 craftsmen and metalsmiths, all strong and fit for war. Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutol, Hamutol, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. Zedekiah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as Jehoiakim had done. I can get that out there. Because of the Lord's anger, again, verse 20, pay attention to this one. Because of the Lord's anger, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he finally banished them from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Finally banished them from his presence. God said that Jerusalem was going to be the place where his presence was. The temple was there. The, you know, the Ark of the Covenant was there. His presence from all the time from Moses up until this time was there and God finally said enough is enough I'm banishing you from my presence I don't know about you but that's scary to me that's rough that's ter- that's the worst thing that could possibly happen in our lives is to be banished from the presence of God 
close your eyes just for a minute. Father, we thank you so much. And we are not banished from your presence. Or God, that we can come boldly into the throne room of grace. Find help in our time of need. God, I thank you that you don't turn your eyes from us. Lord, we need you and we thank you that you're always there. And we bless you in Jesus' name. So Zedekiah, last king of Jerusalem, of Judah, before the exile happens, thinks he's big stuff. He decides to rebel. I mean, he's 21 years old. He reigns for 11 years. He went 32 years old. Decides to rebel against the, the king Nebuchadnezzar. There's just, it's kind of like a skeleton crew in Jerusalem, right? There's nobody there anymore. I mean, the poorest of the poor people were left. And, and here he's going, hey, I'm going to rebel. I'm something big. I'm big and tough. I can, I can withstand King Nebuchadnezzar. The problem was is that God had banished. He's like, hey, that's it. You're done. It's enough. No more. I'm tired of your sin. I'm tired of, of all the way that you've been living. I'm tired of the way that you have treated me and treated my presence. And that's it. You're out of here. And this, this ding-dong, really, he's a ding-dong, turns, he's like, hey, I'm going to rebel against King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, hey, all right, I'm not having that. We already took one king away. We took one king away, and he's hanging out in Babylon, and we have his mom, and we have his kids, and we have all the other officials, and then who, does, who does this guy think he is? So they go, Nebuchadnezzar goes to Jerusalem, and he destroys it. Chapter 25, and you might want to read that, and maybe if you read that in a very worshipful way, your heart would sink as you read it. Because Nebuchadnezzar took the gold from Solomon's temple, but when they come back the second time, they destroy the temple. Like they completely destroy it. They take all the bronze, more bronze that could be measured, more bronze that could be weighed. They take the bronze, they cut it up, they send it, ship it off to Babylon. They destroy the temple. They destroy all, uh, everybody who was somebody who had their house. They destroyed that house. They destroyed everything. They, they wind up taking Zedekiah and the last couple of people that were there that were kind of significant, people that, the gov- you know, people that were in charge. They take them out and they kill them all. Zedekiah, they pop out his eyes, they blind him. And the last thing that Zedekiah sees right before they blind him is King Nebuchadnezzar killing his own sons. So he's like, let me kill your sons, and then they pop out his eyes. That's the last thing you ever see. The last image that is in your mind. I was like, wait, God's a God of love. God's God's a God who cares so much for his people. Why would God allow that to happen? And that's right. God is a God of love, but at some point, God is a God that, hey, I've got to deal with sin. There's going to be some judgment here. And we don't always like that. We don't always want to hear that. We want the God who loves everyone and sits kids on his lap and like, all right, you're coming to heaven and everybody's coming to heaven. And there's no sense or ideas like at some point, God says, enough of that. It's kind of scary to think that maybe if God would do that to his temple, would he do that to maybe our nation? Right? Right? At some point, he might say, enough, United States of America, enough is enough. I have blessed you tremendously. I have given you things. that I've, You have had more wealth than any other nation in the whole history of the world. And what have you done? You squandered it and you've lived immorally and you have allowed this to happen and this to happen. Enough is enough. It's a scary thing. It's a scary thing for me. This guy, Zedekiah, this king, this last king of all of Israel, thinks that he's big stuff. He thinks he can go ahead and go it alone without God. I can go ahead and do it without God. I don't need God. I don't need His presence. I don't need His power. I don't need His strength. I'm 32 years old and I, I can do it. And do we do that? Do we do it that way? 
hey, I'm big tough, I've got maybe some money in the bank, I've got a good job, I've got this, I've got that, I can go it alone, I don't need to go it with God. You know, the, the disciples started to have that idea, maybe thinking about that. I want to look at Matthew chapter 18. We're going to look at that. As we bomb-proof our, our relationship with God, how, how are we going to bomb-proof our relationship? with God so that we don't wind up like Zedekiah. I mean, he had the temple, he had the temple of God there. I mean, you could walk out and you could look. And, you know, we've talked about that before, right? That the temple of God had this like gold, um, gold looking shine to it. It was very white and, and very, when the sun hit it, it was like would shine. And like you couldn't be in Jerusalem without, you know, on a sunny day without like, wow, you know, hey, that's the temple of God. And even with all that, right in your face. So how can we make sure that we bomb proof? We're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, and it says this. At, at, that time, Jesus, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, these guys thought that there was going to be an earthly kingdom, right? And that's understandable. Here's, here's everybody at that time believed that Jesus was going to come or the Messiah was going to come and bring back the way, the way that it was when Solomon's time. That's what they were looking for. That's what they were wanting. The heyday. You look back. Don't we do that sometimes? We look back, man, if it was just you know, back in the 50s. You know, I don't know why people always say that. Back in the 50s, things were so easy. Things were so, you know, it was like, it, you know, kids respected their parents. And, and you know, they, yeah, there was some bad things that happened. But, you know, for the most part, that was the, the cars were awesome. And, yeah, you know, and the 50s. Or maybe people go back to the other times. Like, yeah. So they thought that this was going to be the heyday. And they thought because they were uh, linked up with Jesus. And Jesus was doing all this stuff. Like, yeah, he's got to be the Messiah. All right, so, hey, so who's going to be greatest in your kingdom? Like, who's going to be like your, you know, second in, in command? Who's going to sit at your right hand? Who's going to be at your left hand? And, and, and come on, Jesus, what's it going to look like? And Jesus responds, verse 2. Then he called a child to him and had him stand among them. I assure you, he said, unless you are converted and, be lo- and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, wait a minute. Now that converted, your, your Bible might say something different, means a change. Unless you change from your current idea of what you think people in the kingdom of heaven are going to be like, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a scary thing. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, what are you talking about? He pulls up a kid. He says, unless you're, you convert and you are like this child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, so, when we look at a kid, and we don't look at somebody who's just like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Jesus was talking about the ability to trust and the ability to um, accept authority. So, for instance, this last week, not this week, the week before, um, Early, it was early in the morning. I'm unloading buses at school, and uh, I get a call. Uh, Todd, you need to go to your office. We got a call from the bus bar, and there was an accident. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I knew that there was one bus that wasn't and wasn't here yet, and so I was thinking, oh my gosh, all kinds of things, and my mind was rushing. And so I pick up the phone, like, hey, there was a little little accident. We don't know to what extent. We don't think it was a big accident, but we just want to let you know it happened here and here. And we have somebody on the scene, um, uh, Cypher Police Department is headed out there, and we just wanted to let you know that, you know, there's going to be a bus that's late. So I'm there, and my principal's out, she's out at a conference, and I, uh, I come, and I tell my partner, and my behavioral interventionist, and the instructional specialist, like, hey, I've got to go, we've got we to gotta have somebody on site there, because we don't know what it's like. So I leave, and it was so close that I could still hear them talking on my radio. It was kind of like behind, but it was in um, the nicer, I guess the nicer neighborhood. I'm like, oh man, you know, what, what happened here? And so what, it, it wasn't even a big deal. I come on, this, on the scene, and I was like, what, what happened? And this bus driver just took the turn just a little bit too wide, 
and somebody parked their SUV Lexus kind of like right in the middle of a, of, a, of a turn where they shouldn't, they really shouldn't have been, but this, this bus driver just swung their, the back of their bus just a little bit too much, and there's a reinforced corner on the, on the, on the ends of buses, and so it, winded, it just kind of nicked it. You don't, there's nothing that happens to the bus, right? There's nothing there. There's no color on there. There's no dent on there. But the SUV, the Lexus SUV, has a nice little scratch and a nice little dent. And, of course, you know, fam, people are out there and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I show up, and the kids are like, you know, this parent, they had their, their dog, and they were like, hey, they're putting the dog up to the window and trying to keep kids quiet. And so uh, I get up there, and the kids are saying, hey, Mr. Zabovit is here, yay! And I'm like, oh, boy, what is that? So I get on there, and I'm keeping them calm. And, you know, because it's, I guess, the neighborhood, we have a, a, a deal at school that you can bring your own device. Man, so all these kids have tablets and, and, and phones and stuff. And so I'm like, guys, if you have your tablets, some of them are already out playing Minecraft and all that kind of Guys, if you have your tablets, go ahead and bring them out. Go ahead and play. You can do that. Um, you know, it's not going to be, the bus driver's not going to take them away from you. And uh, I'm just waiting, and then police, the uh, uh, Cypher Police Department shows up. And um, so we're like, all right, hey, how long is this going to take? Because it's been a little while already. I want to get these kids to school. And they're like, oh, we just got to do our little report, and we'll get you on our way, you're on your way. So get up there, and kids are like, Mr. Sepulveda, are we going to be able to eat breakfast? Yeah, you're, you're going to be able. We've already called. We've talked to the cafeteria manager they're going to hope open up the breakfast lines they have breakfast ready for you so if you need to eat breakfast you're going to have it there mr sepulveda do we get to go home no this is not a snow day you do you know you you get to go to school you're not hurt nothing like that is happening so yeah you're going to go mr sepulveda has school already started yes school has already started and then i see i'm looking over and I see this little girl just bawling just bawling and, you know, she's, had, she's been crying so much that all around here is red. And she's just, her eyes are just big old, big old tears. And I walk up to her, I'm like, baby, what's wrong? She goes, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> I'm like, you're not going to jail? Why do you think you're going to jail? They said the police is here. They're here. They're going to take us to jail. I say, look. I'm going to promise you right now, the police is here because they have to make a report. They're not going to talk to any of y'all after they finish their report. They're going to leave and we're going to go to school. <laughs> you sure? Yes, yes, I'm sure. You're not going to jail. If they want to take you to jail, I will stop them, okay? Okay. So a little bit later on, I'm getting off the bus. I'm like, oh my goodness, come on. I'm like, hey, we, I, got, I got a little girl crying. Come on, we got to go. I get back on the bus, and so she stopped crying, but her is still red right here, and she's a little bit better, and, and then, you know, she gets on her tablet. So she's fine, right? And, and everything's good. But she trusted. She trusted that I was telling her the truth, that I was, you know, that I, there's a little bit of history there, to where she knows that I'm going to, I see her in the hallways, and, and although she can't say my, Mr. Pobobida, she can't say my name very, but she knows that what I'm saying is accurate. And that's what Jesus is saying here. you got to come like this child that's going to trust me, that no matter what, this is the person that's going into the kingdom of heaven. Let's keep reading verse 5. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. So Jesus is saying, you need to be, you need to operate in this trust, and then you need to welcome other people who trust. You know, there's a there's an issue. There's this, this idea that we need to be able to trust each other as family. Jesus is saying, guys, there you have a family of people that you need to be able to trust, that you need to be able to rely on. So whoever accepts and whoever welcomes, right? Verse 6. But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. 
If your hand or your foot causes your downfall, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes your downfall, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than to have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. Wow. So you, you need to be a type of person that, that, is trust, that trusts in Jesus. You need to welcome other people that trust in Jesus. But if you're the cause of a downfall of one of these who trust in Jesus, shame on you. Jesus says it'd be better for a millstone. And we're, a millstone is a humongous rock. Tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. And you're going to, there's no, it's like, you know, like, uh, like a mafia movie. They bury you in cement. They put you in cement and throw you into the, to the, to the ocean and you're going to go down and that's it, buddy. You're, you're, you're gone. And Jesus is saying, that's how important it is. Because you've got to make sure that you are living in a way that you don't cause someone else's downfall. You've got to live in a way that you are not being the result Right? That you are not, whatever you do is causing someone else to back away from God. And that's a scary thing. That's a scary thing because, you know what? I run into a lot of things. You know, as it, that I'm like, sometimes I don't want people to know I'm a pastor, you know? It's like, can I just, I just would like to tell you, give you a piece of my mind. Let me just tell you something. But Jesus is saying it's a way that we need to operate that is way different than how the world operates. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that we do not become a stumbling block for someone else? How do we make sure that we do not become that offense that causes someone to, uh, hey, oh, wait a minute, I've got to back away from the Lord a little bit because of what, yo, you're a Christian? Oh, well, wait a minute. Because we don't want anyone to be to leave the presence of God because of something like that. So here, here's the thing. The way that we do that, the way that we bomb-proof our relationship with God, the way that we live differently is that we serve. Jesus says this. Jesus called them over and said, and, and by the way, this is, this is a portion of Scripture when James and John's mother comes up to Jesus and she bows down and she says, uh, he goes, hey, what can I do for you? And, and she says, hey, I, I ask, I request that my sons would sit at your left and right when you enter into your kingdom, when you come into your kingdom, when you become king, right? <clears throat> and the other disciples get upset at that. Like, hey, what, what's up with that? Why, why are, hey, James and John, why are you so special? Why, are you, why do you get to be on the left and right? We want to be on the left and right. Maybe we should, maybe Peter, hey, Peter's the one who said, hey, you know, you're the Messiah, and, 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 and you said, hey, uh, heaven, you know, earth did not show you this, or man did not show you this, but this came from my Father in heaven. So maybe Peter should sit at the right. And Jesus said, yeah. You know, he, got, he must have been kind of fed up with people, you know, with the disciples every once in a while. That guy, come, come here, come here. Circle up. It says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. This is like, there's a way that we live that's so different than what the world says. 
The world says, hey, you, you do this and you do that. You know that the Gentiles, you know that the world, they, the, the leaders of the world, they dominate over their servants. But with us, with those of the kingdom, it's different. You need to be a servant. You need to serve. And Jesus gives us that example all the time. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. He's about to go into his, to the, he's about to be tortured and have a, a torture that's like no one could possibly understand. Like the worst torture ever. And he's about to go into that and he's met by Judas and, and soldiers and, and, and people from the temple and they come and someone, one of the disciples has a sword and, and chops off one of the servant's ears, right? Jesus is about to go into his the last few hours of his life. He's been praying, God, tears of blood, right? It like could have been like sweat of, of blood coming off of his, off of his brow. He's like, God, if, if, Father, if this could be taken from me, yeah, but, it, but not my will, your will. He's going to have this, this rough time. He knows that. And then even in all that, he sees this guy's ear comes off, and he grabs this ear, right? And he prays for this guy's ear, and he puts his ear back on. So even in the most troubled time, Jesus is no, knows he's going into this troubled time. He knows what's awaiting him. He's still serving. On the cross, on the cross, he's still serving. The thief making fun of him, people making fun of him, poking fun of him. At any time, he can just say, 10,000 angels, poof, and everybody just like, you know, just incinerate everyone. But he's, he's there, and he's dying for you, and he's dying for me. And this, this, the thief looks at him, and he says, hey, Jesus, when, don't forget me. When you enter into your kingdom, don't, don't forget me. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Sitting there, suffering. Now the way you died from the cross was from asphyxiation. You, could, you couldn't breathe anymore. And your legs got to a point where they couldn't, you would push up and you would take a breath and then you would come back down and then you would push up and you would get so tired that you couldn't push up anymore and then you would just die because you couldn't take a breath. So he's sitting there crown of thorns has, has pierced his head and he, he's been beaten all this kind of stuff and whipped and, and bruised and, and sitting there and he's kind of pushing up and getting a breath and he's still ministering to the guy to the thief like, hey, today you will be with me in paradise and then still he keeps going right he says John come here bring, bring, bring my mother he's up there and he's dying. And he's hard to breathe. He's like, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your... He's, he's thinking about his mom while he's up there dying on the cross. Hey, take care of my mom. Mom, this is like, this is your surrogate son. Take care of him as your son, as me. Thinking about other people. Thinking about serving other people. Even in his death. And shouldn't we be imitators of that? Shouldn't we live our lives that way? If we were doing that, if we were serving, if we cared about other people like that, would we stumble? Would we be a stumbling block? And it's hard. Let me tell you, it is hard. I know. Friday, let me tell you, man. Oh my gosh, I was going to lose my religion. I had, I had a mother send me a, 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 an email late on Thursday night. Mr. Sepulveda, I know you're going to look in. Blah, 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 blah. I know you're going to look into this. Okay. Sunday morning, she called and left a message. I got the email, but okay, got your message. You know, She called me later on. I was dealing with stuff, and Friday it was like boom, boom, boom. And this was like on top of a crazy, crazy week. Boom, boom, boom. Mr. Sepulveda, you got, yes, ma'am, I am going to look into it. But it, it just wasn't like that. He's like, Mr. Sepulveda, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. But I, ma'am, but I, 
man, but I just went, it's finally just like, okay. Mrs. Fold, are you there? Yes, ma'am, are you finished? No. You know? But here's the thing. I had the other mom. She showed up when I was dealing with this kid, this mom. She came to have lunch. Took off, took off work to have lunch. Took off the day. And so, like, she's sitting there, and, like, her kid's not there. And, like, the teacher's like, go get Mr. Sepulveda. I'm like, ma'am, can we move to this talk? I need to tell you about your son. <laughs> ma'am, I understand. But <laughs> and then so she finally calmed down, and then she calls the father of this kid. And I'm sitting, I'm like, I, I need caller ID on my phone. I really do. But, and so it rings, and I pick it up, and, like, but it was more like, doo, 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 doo. you know, because he's a father, right? And like, doo, doo, doo. I'm like, and then by this time, I'm like, come on, how, how much, how patient can I be? I'm like, I, I don't want kids to be in trouble. I don't want to discipline kids. I tell this with parents. We sit down. I say, ma'am, I am not looking. That when your kid gets in trouble, I, this, it creates a lot of work for me. I got to go talk to kids. I got to investigate. I got to write a report. I got to write, I got to do uh, paperwork so it gets entered into the computer. I got to call both sets of parents just to let y'all know what was going on. I don't want to have to deal with this. I got 10,000 other things that I'd rather do. So this, this, this father is like, oh, do, 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 do. and I finally was a little sharp with him and he finally, he finally backed off a little bit and I was able to bring it back. But I can tell you that was one time where at least I was able to dial it back. But there's some times where it's, you know what, it's hard. There's some times it doesn't matter. I don't want to be a servant. There's some times where, where just the world has attacked you. And you know what, it could, be, it could be maybe God trying to teach you something. It could be the devil coming against you. It could be the world coming against you. It could be who knows what it could be. But you know, it, like it begins to wear down and it's hard. And it's kind of like, man, you know what? I want to rip into someone. I want to just, you know, I don't want to be a Christian at this point. I want to tell you how it is. I want to tell you what I feel. I want to just let you know. I just want to get it out, you know. And then you come back as a king. I've got to be a servant. God wants us to operate in a different way. So I know how it's hard being out there. And thank God that God gives us grace, right? Thank goodness that there's grace and there's forgiveness and you mess up and you get the, you get the, you get like, Lord, I messed that one up. Lord, help me. I messed that one up. I need to fix that. I need to take care of that. But God wants that relationship with you. And the way that you keep that relationship sane and right, that you look to serve other people, just like Jesus did. Serving other people, being out there, How do you do it? How do you serve? And I'm not talking about serving here at church, right? I mean, we, we need children's church workers. We need people to, to do different things. We, you know, we're, at some point, we're going to need a nursery, right? We, we know that. But I'm not even talking about that. Because you shouldn't be serving only on Sunday mornings or only when the church is open, right? You should be serving God 24-7, so how do we serve? We listen, we listen, we listen, and we serve. We listen, and we listen, and we listen, and we serve. The fallacy is that a lot of people believe that they need to be completely right with God. I need to have my life taught. My life isn't even together right. How can I be serving someone? You're right. God doesn't want... There's no, none of us, none of us are right with God. None of us are on that, you know, that perfect thing. We're all a work in progress. But let me tell you something. When you're in the, in the midst of it, and even, you know, they, they say like the best thing for someone who is depressed is to go out and help someone. 
You can, you can be depressed and like sit on your couch and eat bonbons and like, oh, the world hates me and I hate the world and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And you're never going to get better. But the minute you go out and you start doing something, or you start, and maybe it's just, man, they're, they're more jacked up than me, you know? <laughs> and maybe that, that does it for you. Or maybe it's just like, hey, you know, I feel good helping someone else out. But it's the same, same kind of thing. God doesn't want you perfect. If he wanted you to be perfect, he wouldn't. He would have done a whole different situation scenario, because because we can't we can't be perfect. He wants regular people, broken people, people who who are who have issues, being out there and being his hands and feet. So we listen, and we listen, and we listen, and we serve. So there might be someone that you know who is uh, just tired. You know, Belinda brought up the story the other day when, when we had the kids and, and she was just like, it's kids, it's nonstop kids all the time, you know? It's like kids all the time. Diaper, you know, let me give you something to eat. Diaper, let me give you something to eat. Run around, not get any sleep. Run around, do this, do that, and get a bath, and oh my gosh, and change out and wash clothes and do this. And it's like, at some point, she's like, I needed to do something that was not kid-related. And I'm like, yeah. And I don't remember. She said, I said, go do something fun with one of your friends. I don't remember that. I'm sure when she got back, I was like, here, here you go. <laughs> but there might be someone in your life that you know who's dealing with that. He's like, hey, can I, can I take your kid? I mean, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to babysit so you can go out and maybe do your thing. I'll, I'll babysit so you can just take a nap. Yeah? Right? Maybe there's other people out there who are struggling with their finances. And you're hearing it. Right? You're hearing it. Oh man, my car broke down again. I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. And so you're hearing it. My husband lost his job. So you're hearing it. My kids, two broke and now we weren't expecting this we don't have the money to pay for this and you're hearing that and then you come back and it's like look i i'm going to be praying for you i don't i'm i don't have any money that i can offer you but you know i do have a book maybe that i that i use to help myself a while back maybe Dave Ramsey's book or whatever, or I'll be happy to help you look at your budget and to see if there's some things that we can kind of finagle here so that you can have a little bit more money to spend. I know you're having relationship problems over here, right? So let me, let me, I'm listening to what you're saying. Can I give you some advice? Can I link you up with someone that might be able to help you? Can I... Can I pray for you? You know, and we say that, you know, prayer is a cop-out because it's like, oh, it's so simple to pray, but we don't even do that. Can I, can, I, can I pray for you? I've been trying to do that more. I've been trying to not just say it, but doing it right there on the spot because I know that you can say it and then you're going to forget it and not because you're, you're, you d- you were just trying to... Um, give them a story and just trying to make them feel good and, and but it's just life happens and you forget I walk down the halls and teachers tell me something I'm like you know you gotta do you want me to send you an email yeah I mean they don't even ask me anymore you know you want me to send you an email like, yeah I don't even have to, what I meant is I don't have to say anything anymore like, Todd we need to do this, this this I'll send you an email good because I'm not going to remember because I walk down the halls and five people tell me five different things and by the time I get back I'm like I don't remember right and so praying right off the bat. So you know, sometimes prayer is a cop-out. I'm like, oh yeah, we just pray for him and say, God bless you. And, but yeah, the, it, it, prayer is powerful. So we can at least pray. So here is the homework for you this week. Just like your kids have homework. You got some spiritual homework. Listen to the people around you. Listen to Let's go ahead and have the worship team go ahead and come on up. Listen to your family. Listen to your kids. Listen to your coworkers. When you 
are out talking to your neighbor, when you're at the grocery store, wherever you are, listen. And if it is in your power to help them, if it is in your power to serve them <coughs> in some way, well then serve them. If it's all you can do is just, hey, all I can do is just pray, well then just, just pray. But get to a point where we're, we don't think that we are so on top of it, that we're not like Zedekiah, or we're not making that mistake like the disciples. And saying, hey, we're just waiting for the kingdom of God to come down and take us away. But Lord, until you come, what can I do here to be your hands and feet? How can I serve? What can I do out there?